Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience as we got ourselves um, reconnected and, and ready to show our presentation. We're very pleased to continue this webinar series on the epidemiology of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have a brief video that we'd like to show. This is um, a short video welcome from our Dean in regards to the series on the epidemiology of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi, I'm Dean Boris Lushniak, and welcome to the special seminar series on the epidemiology of COVID-19. This is an incredible moment in history for us to be tackling the pandemic of COVID-19. And what a great opportunity for us to be able to work together and to educate each other on the pathways ahead. First of all, thank you much to the organizers of this seminar series and for having this forum for us to be able to exchange ideas. Over the next few days, you'll be listening to experts in the field who want to have an interchange with you, an exchange of ideas with you through the webinar that we're presenting now. In the next few days, you'll be hearing from Dr. Olivia P Carter Pokras, well, part of our faculty here at the University of Maryland. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Travis Gales and Chung Fu Lu from the Montgomery County Department of Health who are out there in the front lines of public health action against COVID-19. And then finally, you'll hear from our esteemed chair of the department, Dr. Hong Ji Lu. So this combination is not just about that foursome presenting to you, but it's the interchange of ideas in the midst of a public health crisis. We learn from each other. So let's utilize the seminar series to get better at what we're doing. Thank you very much for attending this and let's learn together. Thank you very much, Bennett, for showing that welcome from our Dean. Those first webinars are available for viewing on our School of Public Health website, as well as the presentation from last week from Dr. Carlos Garcia Salgado about how Latin American epidemiologists are tackling this pandemic. So today, we are uh, very pleased to have one of our colleagues who's going to be talking about his work to incorporate information about mobility into the modeling that's going on to better manage this pandemic. He's a colleague of Dr. Liu, our chair. So we're very pleased that he's been able to take time out of his busy schedule to give a presentation uh, with us. So Dr. Zhang, are you available and ready to go? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you, uh, Olivia, for the introduction. And thank, uh, thanks to Dr. Liu and also uh, others at uh, School of Public Health and Department of Epidemiology for your warm invitation to be part of this great webinar series. And uh, uh, so my name is uh, Li Zhang. I have, I, I really know, I, I'm, one thing I'm pretty sure going into this webinar is that I, I, I know the least about epidemiology uh, compared to all of you in the uh, audience. So what I thought I would be able to do as director of the Maryland Transportation Institute at the University of Maryland is to share what we have learned uh, since March on how mobility data uh, could actually potentially help uh, the great work you are doing whether it's epidemic modeling, or it's about looking at health out outcomes, health disparity, or you know, other aspects of public health and epidemiology related to COVID-19 in general. So, so I hope I can bring that uh, data, mobility data perspective into the discussion. Uh, I would consider this uh, webinar a success if uh, some of you, understand a bit more about the mobility data that is available to help with your work and your research. And if uh, you actually identify a way or two to incorporate the kind of mobility data to help improve the outcomes of your research or uh, your work at agencies or in the private sector. Um, you know, what I want to the way I want to start, I, and I assume in terms of time management, Olivia, that I have about 
maybe half an hour to 40 minutes to give the talk. And then this is a one hour webinar and we have about 20, uh, at least 20 minutes for Q&A and discussion. Uh, did I make that assumption correctly? That sounds wonderful. And I just posted in the chat a reminder for everybody to hold their questions until the end. Um, and they can post their question in the chat box if they don't want to forget it. So I just wanted to, to make sure everybody's on the same page about that. Um, and also, as a reminder, please mute yourself and so all of us can, can hear better. Thank you so much, Dr. Sang. Okay, yep. So uh, I want to start out by uh, giving an overview of who we are. So at the Maryland Transportation Institute, we are a very multidisciplinary research institute uh, that is uh, established with uh, through, through the fiscal year 2018 provost initiative. Our official home is in engineering, but our affiliated faculty and labs really represent 11 out of the 12 colleges in the um, uh, University of Maryland. So it's very multidisciplinary. And you know, there, there are a lot of good things I can talk about our institute, but one area that is most relevant to COVID-19 is that our institute uh, through our cat lab has been running the largest transportation and mobility data center in the US uh, for the past 20 years. What we do is we get data about person movement, freight movement, uh, just about anything that moves from federal agencies, from state local governments, as well as from you know, private, private sector, including uh, internet companies and other data providers uh, that provides all kinds of data that's related to mobility. And we also have a, a platform as a service or software as a service platform that provides data services to more than 12,000 uh, public sector and private sector data users in all 50 states. The particular data source that has proven to be the most useful in COVID-19 response is our uh, mobile device data. So this data come from cell phones, smartphones, uh, they come from GPS devices. So essentially we get anonymized location data from more than 150 million uh, mobile devices across the nation. Every single day we get data from multiple data providers and we clean the data, we uh, merge the data and fuse the data in a way that we can use to do all kinds of analysis. Before COVID-19, I would say, you know, my interaction, the interaction between our work and epidemiology only probably came about uh, twice or three times over the past 12 years that I've been at the University of Maryland. It was, I remember there was one CDC webinar or seminar that I uh, was invited to to talk about some of the modeling we did with this kind of data where I learned that epidemiologists have also been developing models of uh, people movement and try to use that to enhance their epidemic model outcomes. Uh, and so one thing I wanna emphasize is that we do not have any personal information in the data. So all the data has been desensitized. We do not know who the person is. All we have is an anonymized and hashed device ID, but this device ID does stay consistent over time. So we're able to look at uh, behavior change over time. And we see a lot of devices every day, but we still do not see all the devices every single day. Even if we see a device in the data, we do not see all the movements associated with that device. So, 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 so you can think of it as a continuous stream of data, but that's broken in so many different places. So, so there is also some methodology that needs to be there in order to ensure that any analysis done on this kind of data or any results we obtain from such analysis are representative. Uh, so, so it does, you know, we cannot just take the data and look at the trend in the data. The trend in the data does not necessarily reflect mobility trend or other trends in the real world, because in some cases, uh, the sample size could fluctuate day by day uh, in a very big way. So, so uh, you know, I guess the point is, this is a great near real time data, but there are also issues uh, for, for researchers and uh, agencies and others 
that are looking to, to use the data. Uh, so around late March, when there were a lot of discussions about instituting stay at home orders and shelter in place orders with so much interest in mobility behavior, we realized that you know, there was something we could do. So over a two week period of time, a, you know, our developers got together. We were able to get support from Amazon also uh, because previously we were doing this kind of computing with a much longer timeline, like uh, supporting US federal government in understanding travel. But now we have to do this kind of calculation uh, every single day, but we were able to overcome that obstacle to really get a cloud computing resources from Amazon to do it. So what we ended up, ended up having for the public and the agencies and everyone is an open access COVID impact analysis platform. Uh, I'm not sure how much of you, you know, how many of you already have been to the platform website, but it's at uh, data dot covid dot umd dot edu uh, again data dot covid dot umd dot edu and and i will i will actually just give you a quick demo of what is there uh, i assume you can see my platform sharing window is that true can you see my uh, platform window instead of the slides Olivia, can you see that? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Awesome, <coughs> excuse me. So when you go in there, you essentially, we, you know, we provide this data. Uh, so we, we do the computing, I'll get to the methods on how we actually do the computation after this, but we produce a number of metrics in four different categories. We provide a metrics on mobility and social distancing such as uh, a social distancing index, percentage of people staying home, number of trips per person, uh, what kind of trips are they going to work? Are they going for non-work purposes? Uh, what percentage of the trips are coming from out of state to Montgomery County or to any other county in the nation? What percentage of trips are coming from you know, other external areas? Uh, miles traveled per person. Then we also bring in COVID and public health data from other sources, but then we also compute some of our own data by merging mobility data and house data. Uh, so one example of that is uh, what we call uh, imported COVID cases. So what this measure does is on a daily basis, we estimate of all the trips coming to the state of Maryland or any county, any state in the nation, how many of these trips are by people who are actively infectious. Uh, so this is essentially a combination of mobility data, origin destination travel pattern, and also the uh, COVID-19 status at a trip origin, right? So that's how we combine the mobility data and public health data to create measures that would allow epidemiologists and others to be able to track the movement of viruses carried by people from one area in the nation to another area in the nation. You know, there are others. Uh, the third category is about economic impact. Uh, so we also use mobility data to estimate things like percentage of people working from home based on how often people visit different consumption sites. We estimate number, uh, percentage changes, mostly reduction in consumption, uh, but we're also bringing uh, our estimate of unemployment rate. Uh, the difference between what we estimate and what Bureau of Labor Statistics does is that we are able to provide these estimates and update them more frequently than federal agencies because you know it usually takes time for federal statistical agencies to be able to publish the data. But our method rely on uh, near real time mobility data, so we are able to provide these information in a more timely manner. But uh, you know periodically we do recalibrate our estimate after federal agencies publish their data three months later. Uh, also some information on vulnerable populations. Uh, you can sort, you, you can select which, which variables you want to add uh, or you want to subtract from, uh, from, from the table. And you can see a trend for different states and for different variables and see what they look like. And you can select a different time periods to query the data and visualize the data. 
And, and you can also see national statistics for a particular day, and you also be able to see that trend also. We're adding a feature there. And then you can go to the county, you can select any state, uh, like Maryland. Uh, so this is their social distancing trends. It, it went up really quickly in mid-March, it stayed there. Uh, it's gradually coming down now, but you know we're still having a significant level of social distancing uh, in, in, in Maryland. Uh, then you can, you can select other things to show. Uh, let, let me just say, show, maybe we can try to, uh, you can also go to the county view. So you can see all the different counties in the nation uh, and you can search a county. Uh, I can do Montgomery County. Maryland, oh, there are a lot of Montgomery County. So, so you can see the county level statistics, uh, testing capacity, you know, we're doing better, still not 12% yet. Uh, then some of the other things we have is a SARA index, a SARA tool, what we call society and economy reopening tool, assessment tool, where we essentially bring in out of the 38 metrics uh, based on inputs from uh, our colleagues at the public health and epidemiology and others, we, we put together a list of 16 most important metrics for reopening consideration. Uh, for those metrics that have is, established the gating criteria, we also compare uh, the values for a particular county or a particular state against the gating criteria. So Montgomery County, uh, right now testing capacity gap, which is measured by positive test rate is 16%. Uh, but the threshold from WHO is, you know, suggested is 12%. So here, a county or state can view how they are doing over time on each of these important factor areas, and also how they are doing compared to the rest of the nation. We also have the percentile ranking uh, among all the counties and states in the nation. And then, you know, there are things here with a tutorial page on how to use the platform some description of the methodology, uh, some of our findings and publications, and also uh, press coverages. Uh, so there, was all, there have been a lot of uh, press interest uh, in, in this. Uh, I'm going back to my slide deck. Just try to. Um, so, you know, the, these are some of the pictures we generated to summarize the overall patterns on um, mobility, right? So here you can see the states like DC, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, and Maryland are doing, still doing pretty well compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, we, we have a graph that's up to date. This one is a little bit old now, but what's interesting is that uh, even before states started reopening, you know, we saw a lot of people that just, uh, you know, for various reasons, decided not to practice social distancing. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Liu's group and others at uh, our School of Public Health have been using our data and others' data uh, to feed these mobility metrics into their epidemic models and have found the kind of uh, mobility data and social distancing data to be helpful in helping them predict uh, future cases and infection rates, et cetera. You know, we also look at, you know, I'm not sure if it's of interest to this group, but we have various kinds of measures, economic impact. So this one just shows how well the economy is rebounding uh, before and after reopening, looking at a visits to restaurants, to sh retail shops, to movie theaters, and all this kind of consumption sites. Uh, working from home, we, at, at one time, you know, we had as much as 35% of people in the uh, workers in the nation working from home. But you know, in most places now, we don't see as many people working from home now. Uh, I already mentioned the Sarah tool, and I won't repeat that. <clears throat> now, now uh, I assume some of you might be interested in how we actually, you know, wh how this kind of data gets translated through computational algorithms into these statistics. So hopefully, you know, this five, you know, I'll plan to spend about three to five minutes to explain to you what when into the process that convert these raw data. Uh, the raw data essentially are latitudes and longitudes and timestamps and a hashed anonymized device ID. And we get you know, trillions of these data points every single day 
how, how do we process that? <clears throat> and, and hopefully this can shed some light if you are thinking about different ways that you might be able to use the data uh, in ways that's not already published on our platform or others' dashboards. Uh, so we, we take the data from different sources. Uh, we, we try to build the most comprehensive mobility data by working with now six different original data aggregators. We merge their data together. Uh, we also get similar data on the on the freight movement side. I'm not that might be of less interest to this group. Uh, then we need to clean the data. Data come from different sources. The same devices may be observed twice or even three times or five times in different original data sources. And uh, you know there is a lot of noises in the data. So we need to do data quality check, removing duplicates and cleaning, and to fuse the data. And then you know we <coughs> we impute anonymize the home work locations and we use algorithms to identify missing information that might be of importance to epidemiologists and public health experts uh, that includes uh, how people travel it's not just this person made a trip but also did, did this person drive did this person carpool did this person uh, uh, use transit or walk or bike so travel modes Trip purpose, what, where does the trip first, you know, what's the purpose of the trip? Going to work, essential or non-essential work, or this person is going for different kinds of uh, uh, shopping, recreation, social visits, and that kind of purposes. And we also in, in, uh, infer, so from the raw data, we do not know who this person is. We do not know the income, gender, age of the person. But, you know, from health analysis point of view, we understood there is some interest in knowing that as well. So, we also impute uh, based on anonymized information on the visit pattern, travel pattern, homework pattern. Uh, we impute the income, age, and gender of this anonymized device. And then we publish the data. Um, so so then, then there is also a waiting process. And, and then we calibrate, validate the results, and then we provide these uh, behavior metrics. Uh, but, you know, and on a platform, we only provide the results at the, uh, national, state, and county levels, but we're able to do that at a you know, much smaller geographic levels, a, 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 a census block or just a street block. Uh, the only thing that we need to be careful is that if the, the, the level of geographic analysis unit gets very small for your house analysis, then we might not be able to provide that data because if the number of devices we see in a particular analysis, geographic analysis unit is too few. Let's say fewer than five, or actually we, we industry standard is five. We actually being extra cautious on privacy protection. So first is a 30. If we see fewer than 30 devices in that area, then we do not provide that data for privacy protection. Uh, these things I'll go through quickly. Uh, if you're interested, you can always ask me questions later on. Uh, the challenge about identify trips is that, you know, the data is noisy. And if I walk to a bus station, ride a bus, uh, transfer a bus, then walk to the final destination, that's one trip. So we need to be careful not to identify that as one walking trip to the bus station, then another trip on the bus, then another walking trip. So, so it's just, uh, you know, to be able to uh, accurately identify activity locations and make sure that we identify trips the way it should be. And then we use different AI algorithms to operate uh, our data to do imputation of travel modes, trip tra purposes, and social demographics, as I have explained to you before. Uh, the choice and the design of these AI and machine learning algorithms matter. Uh, you know, with certain algorithms, we're able to reach a very high level of individual trip level estimation accuracy on whether this trip is going to work or going for not work going, you know, is by different kinds of travel modes or social demographics. Uh, but computational cost is also heavy. You know, the most accurate algorithm tend to also cost you, cost us the most amount of money in terms of a computational cost. So, so sometimes we make a trade-off between, uh, you know, how much we have to pay for computation and, you know, what is the marginal increase in the accuracy based on a specific use case. Uh, weighting is important, even though the, the sample size is very large, but we know it's a biased sample. Uh, mobile device sample tend to be biased against 
low income groups, it tend to be biased against uh, the more senior age group. So, and also we don't have any data for younger kids, which, which is actually, you know, we, we don't intend to do any analysis on younger kids for important sensitive privacy protection. Uh, so we need to expand our, our sample to the population. Uh, the way we do that is we use data from both the sensors on population side and social demographics. Then we also use, uh, you know, other travel data. Like we know on any given roadway, how many vehicles are traveling past that roadway. Uh, ridership on a specific bus in some cases. So we're combining these different data sources together to be able to do a multi-level weighting. So we weight every device in our sample. We also weight every single trip associated with the device in our sample. So, so it's a multi-level weighting for us to be able to address different kinds of biases in the data. So the results represent what the population does. Um, then we, you know, I think what's, what's different from what we are doing and some of the others that we saw from, uh, you know, other data, pro, you know, some of the other mobility metrics is uh, we, we didn't start doing this uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, our group has been doing this since about six, seven years ago, leading uh, U.S. Department of Transportation's mobile device big data pilot. Uh, for the past six years, we've been working on these algorithms. So we have done a lot of uh, validation on the results from our computation and the control totals from different federal agencies. Uh, wouldn't get into the details. So, so that helped us and our data users establish confidence in the accuracy and the validity of the estimated mobility metrics. So I see it's already 1.30. Uh, so maybe I'll spend another 10 minutes to show you some actual data use cases. It's how the mobility data is used by agencies and companies and others in their response to COVID-19. Um, I will not go through all of them. This is a list of some of the main use cases that we've learned from people who write to us, who ask us for different kinds of data. Uh, so I'll, I'll pick a few that I think that should be of most interest to this particular audience group. Uh, in, in terms of the federal government, uh, CDC actually is using our data for their uh, COVID response. I think in general, they're doing their own epidemic models um, in, in, you know, by leverage using the mobility data and social distancing indexes we have produced to help them understand the overall trend and growth you know, and, and reduction of cases across the nation. Uh, Department of Veterans Affairs are using our society and economy reopening assessment tool to help them determine when to reopen uh, different VA facilities in specific states and uh, counties. Uh, interest from, there actually a, has been a lot of interest from, from the Department of Treasury, Federal Reserve Banks, different branches of Federal Reserve Banks, and uh, the big names in the financial sector, Bank of America, uh, Capital One, and, and a bunch of others, investment firms, they, they all want this data because I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of money at the state, but I don't think they're using this to look at health. Uh, some interesting overall mobility trends, um, you know, uh, on travel distance changes. Uh, it, it, people's time use has also changed. For those of you who are looking at the impact of activity participation and people's spatial behavior, uh, obesity or health, we've actually seen a lot of interesting changes, right? So uh, I, I've been sitting in this chair way too long since the beginning of stay at home. I, I assume that's true for every one of you also, but we also see even for out of home activities, right? So because our data can also look at time use patterns. When people, you know, do people walk more? Uh, they do. And, and do they, you know, when they go to different activities, do they spend more time there? Uh, so we, we, we have that information as well. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. We can work with you on that, uh, on not only travel, but activity pattern, time use pattern of a large number of individuals. Uh, this just shows visits uh, in terms of banks, right? Uh, the, 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 it, it, the number of visits to the banks has gone down, and, but it's now slowly coming back. Uh, visits to educational institutions, you know, still you know, pretty much uh, uh, minimum. Uh, another area that we have found interesting, we're also working on a paper now uh, to try to really using all the travel between states, between counties, 
and it imported the case variable that I explained to you earlier to try to trace the spread of the coronavirus across the US. So we're, we're trying to link up uh, you know, all the movements <clears throat> from New York City to, the, to elsewhere in the nation, from Washington, from outside of the nation coming in, where did they go? Uh, try to uh, initially look at correlation, but then hopefully to be able to recreate essentially a dynamic map that shows the movement of people and viruses with them across the nation and how that led to uh, virus, you know, new cases and virus outbreaks across the nation. Essentially try to use data to recreate as much as possible you know, what really happened in terms of the spreading of this virus in the US. And what we saw in, that was interesting was that after reopening, when, whenever one place reopened, all of a sudden you see a lot of people from outside of that area. Uh, when Georgia reopened, you know, a lot more trips come to Georgia from other states. Uh, when different part, when a certain parts of Maryland reopened, we saw a lot of movements from Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Northern Virginia traveling to that part of, uh, of Maryland. Uh, that, and we also saw that people leaving, uh, what's interesting is that's in a delivery with Sanity Department of Transportation uh, at, a, at a feds. What we noticed was uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, like mid-March, we actually saw a huge spike in the number of long distance trips in the nation. Uh, so what that means is that when when all of us realized this is not a good situation, a lot of people decided to make long distance trips. So these are either people who are leaving New York City, leaving the epicenter of the outbreak, go to other places. They might have brought the viruses with them. And then all the people who want to go home, who, who want to go back to home if, if they are you know, studying or you know, somewhere. So, so that, that, that's something that, that was interesting. Uh, we, we also saw a very high correlation between imported cases and, and COVID cases. Uh, you know, these two maps are showing the heat maps of imported cases into different zip codes in Maryland and uh, number of uh, COVID cases in different zip codes in Maryland. And you can see how, how similar uh, these two maps uh, look like. And, and other areas we're doing, you know, in addition to providing some of these data for health, public health agencies and researchers on our platform nationwide, our team has also been working very closely with uh, several counties in the state of Maryland, uh, including Baltimore County, Prince George's County, uh, Howard County, and uh, uh, Baltimore City. You know, we're also providing some data to Mont Montgomery County. And, and, and these use cases are not on the platform. So for instance, in Baltimore County, what we're doing is, you know, they, they have so many places that they worry uh, could have new outbreaks. Uh, they, they don't have enough manpower to monitor social distancing uh, at, at every one of these 6,000 plus places. So we actually use our data on a daily basis, monitor travel trends and visits to each one of these 6,000 plus vulnerable locations and, you know, predict the risk of new outbreak at each of these locations every single day. It, it, you know, the risk depends on <clears throat> how many people visit this location compared to the capacity of these locations. And it depends on where these trips come from. Uh, so here it just shows, you know, for different kinds of locations in Baltimore County, how the visits to these locations have been changing uh, over time in the past three or four months. Uh, we're providing this to, you know, several other counties too. Um, I'll skip this one. And, and this, this is another one that uh, counties are showing interest is our ability to be able to do community level contact tracing uh, almost instantly. So, so if there is unfortunately a new outbreak at a supermarket, uh, in a church or uh, at a particular location, uh, we, we have developed an algorithm that within seconds, it can pull data on uh, who has, not who, uh, where people have come from that visited that location in the past two weeks, three weeks, or whatever, and, and where they have traveled to. So essentially, we can instantly create a map, heat map, such as like, like the one you saw, you, you're seeing, you're viewing 
on the slide that shows the risk because of the outbreak, where the viruses might have traveled to related to that outbreak. And then based on that, and you know, traditionally the way to do that is through uh, you know, individual level contact tracing, uh, which is super, super important, uh, but it takes time. And in many places, there still aren't enough people that uh, can do that. Uh, but this can be done instantly to supplement uh, traditional boots on the ground contact tracing. And, and we can even recommend a area using AI that if this supermarket had a new outbreak, now this is a logical local containment zone. So you don't have to go back to total shutdown for the entire county or state. You could actually either provide you know, different kinds of interventions to encourage people in this local zone to practice social distancing or try to stay home or voluntarily or in, in some other ways. So, so that's another use case that we found interest. <clears throat> um, uh, job recovery, um, I, I'll skip this one. So we, we, we're, we're producing a lot of uh, metrics and uh, tools for looking at uh, financial impact and uh, job impact. Uh, this may have implications for health equity uh, if you look at it, there, are, there, there has been a lot of concern that this pandemic potentially will, I mean, it's already, you know, we see that already. It's not a hypothesis. We already see that in, in data that is certainly affecting certain population groups and uh, uh, certain communities a lot more than others. Uh, so what we are, you know, what we can contribute here is not only look at uh, visits, but we can look at, you know, how many people lost their jobs uh, and, and then what are they doing right now to try to adjust to this? Uh, though people who are in the low income category, some of the uh, specific uh, racial and ethnic groups and certain communities, how, you know, how people there are adjusting to this new norm. And, and as they are making adjustment, whether it's looking for a new job or try to get certain things done, are they, you know, are they being exposed to more risk? of catching the virus than, than other groups, right? So, so this is an area we can potentially also collaborate with uh, public health experts on. Uh, so with that, I think I used uh, my 40 minutes. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, this is just uh, a summary of three main ongoing research efforts at our institute uh, related to the mobility data and, and related to public health. Uh, one area is, as I mentioned, that we're looking at the complete origin destination travel pattern uh, in order to recreate the process of all the human movement since the beginning of the year and, and, and try to connect that with the virus data in a way to be able to reconstruct the spatial temporal dynamics of the spread of the virus. Uh, the second area is, you know, we're working with Dr. Liu and others at epidemiology. We're also working with the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Johns Hopkins researchers and others to see, really, at, you know, find out a way, you know, what, what is the best way, right? In addition to just throwing the social distancing index or some other metric into an epidemic model and, and see how that predicts different numbers, you know, the question we ask is, what, if, what is the best way to leverage this kind of mobility data in the modeling and decision support for public health, right? So we want to ask some more fundamental questions on leveraging this kind of data. And lastly, this is a more practitioner, this is more oriented to applications and use cases. So we are, we are able to work with selected counties on you know, things like uh, uh, social distancing monitoring, visit monitoring, uh, analysis of new outbreaks and external trips and, and et cetera. But there's, there's no way uh, our team could do that for every county, every state. So what we are doing is we also try to package the kind of tools we have developed for selected specific counties we are working with side by side into uh, application program interfaces or APIs to throw them, you know, open that API on our platform later on. So any state, any agency, any county, or even any individual, uh, if they have an interest, as long as the, uh, user pri data privacy is protected, we would allow them to leverage these tools uh, on our platform uh, as much as they can to the extent that we do not violate either privacy protection or our agreement with the original data providers. 
Uh, so that concludes my presentation. I want to thank uh, the Department of Epidemiology and a a School of Public Health for organizing this wonderful webinar series. And uh, thank you for your time and attention. And then look forward to uh, getting your input, um, you know, suggestions on what additional research we can do here at the University of Maryland. And, and also look forward to uh, seeing what questions and comments uh, you may have. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very enlightening and the wonderful examples that you have provided in the chat box. I posted that link from every, for everybody, but they can also see it at the bottom of your, your last slide, the mm -hmm. link so they can go to your platform. I've also put the announcements for the uh, previous webinars as well as uh, the upcoming ones in case anybody wants to cut and paste those. So now we have an opportunity for questions. Does anybody have any questions? You can raise your hand or put in the chat box. While we're waiting for people to gear up, I do have a sort of an observation, just um, the interesting information that you were sharing about what people were doing after the restrictions started to be lifted. I was thinking here's an opportunity also is to verify information that people may be reporting in surveys to see how accurate that information is. How far off are we in terms of whether they say they're staying home or not? Be kind of interesting to compare and contrast that. Oh, absolutely. So uh, this is a limit anecdotal because I myself did not really look into some of the surveys because, you know, when early on when we were uh, uh, getting some of the media interviews, the question was, you know, how come your data are so different from what we heard from the surveys, right? People were citing that in surveys, you know, close to 90% of people saying they are staying home, but, you know, our data were not showing that. Uh, we, we only show about, uh, even in Maryland, you know, less than half, many at, 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 you know, 40 to 50% of people are staying home. And we know we, we know our data are probably closer to the truth because we also have other data, like uh, how many people are actually driving still on the, uh, on the roadway. Uh, we only saw about a 40% reduction in the amount of traffic uh, on, the, on, on highways, uh, not 80% not reduction, uh, like what we saw in, in European countries, right? So our data also cover other countries. So if you look at Spain, you look at uh, you know, different parts of Italy, uh, you, you, have, you know, we are seeing 80, 90% reduction in mobility, but in the U.S., that reduction number has never gone below uh, 40%. You know, very interesting. And, 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 and the geographic difference of percentage of people staying home is also very, very uh, significant. Is that perhaps because most of us have to get in a car to go to, for instance, a grocery store? Do you think that's part of the reason why such a dramatic difference uh, between countries? Mm, I, I, you know, certainly like you, I know a bit more about the lifestyle here in the U.S. than in Europe. In Europe, I, I, you know, I was just a visit, you know, visitor and tourist, right? So um, that could contribute to some of that. Uh, but you know, in our data, what we saw is it's not just trips to uh, a lot of, with all the trips that people are making. These are not just trips to uh, uh, to grocery shops. You know, a lot of people are still going to work. Uh, in, in you know, we see it in Maryland, uh, even in early April, you know, we still see more than 40% of people are still going to work. Um, you know, only about, I think half of the work were categorized as essential in Maryland. You know, our data confirmed that about 40% of the workers were still traveling uh, to work. And we did see a lot more people traveling, you know, walking to the park and others. Uh, so, so that, and in rural areas, people's behavior changed very little, uh, which, uh, which makes sense, right? So they have to travel, like you said, to, to go maybe travel even 20, you know, 50 miles to, to just to do shopping. And which is fine, you know, cause they can still easily observe social distancing, physical distancing rules uh, over there. So that made us actually realize that, you know, some of the measures we provide do not really capture very well the person to person interactions that public health experts really need to capture. So I had discussions with some of you on the webinar right now and we were trying to figure out how to actually develop a better measure of physical, physical distancing, you know, with the kind of data we have that hopefully can, uh, can, can, can provide a better input to epidemi uh, epidemiologists when, when they do their work. 
Thank you so much. Dr. Liu, would you like to add anything about um, uh, what was just- I'm actually also very interested in learning. You know, I, I see names I don't know, I don't recognize. So if anyone is willing to share with me and the rest of the group on what you do and your take on mobility data and potentially in what you do, you know, I, I would greatly appreciate that too. You don't have to ask a question. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, this is Hong Jie Liu. Uh, well, on behalf of the department, I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank Dr. Zhang for uh, his great work uh, uh, on the social distance indexes. Um, our group is currently uh, using this index to predict the epidemic in Maryland and other um, uh, states. The, um, the capability of his social distancing index to the scope of epidemic is great. Um, we, um, we use his indexes for two metrics, and we recently submit, submit them to journals. And the findings will make a huge contribution uh, to the field. Uh, Nice job and a great job. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Liu, but that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, your, for, for the kind of words. That, no, you know, the, I, the, the, the one thing I observed is this. We will see the epidemic either decrease or increase within about five days because protect um, demonstrations on street provide a good natural experiment of social distance. When people on street to demonstrate their rights, no one can keep distance. Theoretically, after four, five days, we would see the increased number of cases simply because of the relax of social distance on street. Um, however, <laughs> my theory is this, even though people relax for a while or cease the social distance measures, you still see the decline of the daily distance. That's because according to recent study, the virus could not be transmitted by people who do not have any symptoms. And even though uh, people get infected with the virus, if they do not have any symptoms, even though they do not keep social distance, they still cannot transmit the virus to others. Now, if this is true, social distance measures may generate less important compared to uh, what it has done during the surging of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, there were a lot of cases uh, with severe symptoms. In that case, we need to keep social distance and we need to measure the social distance uh, quantitatively. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Um, you did get a response, Dr. Zahn, from one person. Jasmine says she works in food manufacturing. She's an inspector in Texas. She says she's not directly involved in COVID stuff right now, but uh, you should know that we have people not only from Maryland, but also as far away as Texas who are participating today. Okay. And um, uh, one of our faculty member who does a lot of analysis of big data, she had, uh, provided a suggested reading for people who want to see how potentially data like this could be used to study physical activity. As you know, our Department of Kinesiology is the third ranked in the country in terms of graduate programs. And I can see a real potential to look at physical activity. I mean, it raises interesting questions. People have been much more physically active. Will they maintain that after we start going back to work and going back to our regular activities? Yeah, I, I feel so bad because I haven't been physically active at all. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm trying. Uh, but about this. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you so much. And I don't know, um, Quinn, are you on? Are you able to, to um, speak up of how you used similar data? Uh, Olivia, uh, let me uh, uh, display uh, two tables on which uh, we use uh, index index. Can you see here? So we analyze the COVID-19 data for the five states with the highest uh, number of cases. And you can see that this, is, this line represents what happened before the stay-at-home directive. And you can see that his index, the value of index is 35.6. And after the directive, the index increased, meaning people did keep social distance. And this pattern is true for all of our states, meaning the predictability of social distance is great in terms of the scope of the epidemic. And we also uh, use um, his social distance index to predict the reproduction number and the growth rate. And you can see that these two indexes, especially the Dazan index, was highly associated with reproduction number and growth rate across the five states. Good job. Thank you so much, Hanji. That last slide was a little difficult to see. I don't know if you can put it back up and make it larger so we can see it. It was oh. a bit small. So this is a, this is a, let me, let me try to enlarge it. Yeah, if you can enlarge it, that'd be great. So we know the epidemic is determined by the reproduction number. We try to use the social data index to predict the reproductive number. Theoretically, the highest value of index leads to a lower reproduction number, and which is true, which is clearly demonstrated by our data. This association is negative. And also, we estimate growth rate of COVID-19, and we also link social distancing index with growth rate. You can see the patterns are almost similar across the five states. And the, again, the predictability of the two indexes, one is from that down team, the other one from a company called Unicast. And also, if you look at the R square, which re reflects the goodness of fit, is very high. So all of these demonstrates the good predictability of social distancing uh, created by uh, his group. Thank you so much for showing that uh, it looks like late breaking um, data and analysis. We really appreciate it. We did hear back from Quinn. She says that she's using Google Street View data to understand the relationship between built environment characteristics and coronavirus risk. And they're also analyzing social media data to understand race relations during the pandemic. So we are coming to a close for our hour together. Any last questions? Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, uh, uh, Hongjie, for, uh, for the invitation. Well, I did have one last question. Since we okay. do have some students on here, are there any courses or any other preparation that you suggest that students undertake um, if they're interested in, in using mobility data? Well, uh, this is actually a fairly new field, uh, but we have, uh, next, uh, so one of our uh, faculty members teaches a, a data science class using R. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Deb Niemeyer. She's uh, uh, actually a National Academy Engineering member who's new. Uh, we recruited to our institute. She offers a data science class, uh, primarily using R as the programming tool to analyze data. 
Um, so uh, of course, you know, I wouldn't advise probably house students just for the purpose of understanding this data to take my course because my own course is very heavily uh, transportation heavy. Uh, but uh, you know, there, there are, you know, if anybody's interested, uh, you know, I take a look at Dr. Niemeyer's uh, data science class. Then also uh, one thing we're doing is we're trying to build a, what's called a MTI data lab to open up this data analysis infrastructure to others uh, uh, on our campus, including faculty, researchers, and students in public health. So the idea is that we would make it easier for, for you and even faculty members in arts and humanities who probably, you know, their student wouldn't be interested in learning all the details about how to handle this kind of data, but they actually may see use cases in arts and humanities. So we're trying to use a platform as a service set up to make it easier for other researchers to be able to uh, use the data. So, so you could actually go to the platform. You don't have to come to me to talk about collaboration. You know, can we make it, uh, can we scale it up to make it easy for others to leverage both the data access and the algorithms and tools we've already built to, you know, help uh, boost the productivity and, uh, of your own research. So, so that's something we're also working on. So keep, keep an eye on that. And I would encourage, if you want to get newsletters from us to stay abreast of these developments, you're welcome to just send us an email. You know, our website is mti.umd.edu. You can go there and request to be an affiliate with our institute. So that way you are added to not only our email list, you will also get access to all kinds of resources our institute provide to support multidisciplinary research all across campus. Thank you so much for sharing those resources and taking time in your busy day to, to bring late breaking information and research. We greatly appreciate it. And oh. um, for those of you who are interested, um, you can copy the chat box, the resources that we listed in the chat box and also go to the web page where we advertise this and so we'll hopefully be able to post the video and your slides at a later time for folks who want to revisit it oh, you're, you're welcome and it's a pleasure have a good afternoon bye-bye all right thank you